He knows nothing. He knows nothing. It's just, it's just, it's just white noise up there. It's just white noise. It's just, that's all he, that's all he thinks. I find myself in a weird predicament with Do It Yourself. I really like what it's trying to do, and I think it explores its themes subtly yet satisfyingly. But I also find myself unengaged throughout most of the show. Do It Yourself is deep, yet it's also deeply boring. Let's analyze this beast a layer at a time, starting with its themes. In a world where you don't have to do anything, what do you do? That is the question Do It Yourself poses at the beginning of its second episode. Two of the main characters, Yua and Takumin, discuss this question, but they both come to very obvious yet equally unsatisfying answers. They'd simply do more of what they currently consider relaxing and or fun. That's the easy answer, but it's largely avoiding the point, and the show knows that. The rest of the anime then, through subtext, seeks to provide a better answer to this question. Do It Yourself takes place in the future, kind of. It's a very similar world to ours, one that could feasibly exist in like 15 years. The world is even more post-scarcity than it is now, with resources being cheaper and more abundant than ever. This society largely considers the most productive careers to be ones specializing in technology. It is a world in the midst of the AI revolution. AI robots and equipment aren't so out of the ordinary, and students in technology-focused schools are taught that humanity will undergo a revolution as soon as we develop self-aware AI. This is a world where self-aware automated intelligence is not considered an if, but a when. And when we create this technology, we will be brought into a world where all our needs are taken care of and where we are truly free to do as we please. But that just brings us back to the original question. What do we do then? I've thought about this exact question and other related questions a lot over the past few years, in 2022 more than ever, and I'm sure my pondering will only increase now that we're in the new year. It's only recently dawned on me just how startling our technological landscape is. The internet has truly revolutionized our daily lives, and AI most certainly will again. And yet oftentimes, I can't help but feel like some pissed off Luddite in the face of it all. I would consider myself rather cynical about this oncoming, inevitable future. I ask myself, what is the point of drawing the main character of my story when I could write, girl with black, straight hair who is short and has copper glasses, wears a grey hoodie and skinny jeans in an anime style, and get a better drawing from AI in a minute than this thing that took me like three hours? What is the point of writing novels when AI is increasingly becoming capable in that field as well? What is the point of having entertainment at our fingertips 24-7? Of being able to put on a podcast even in the shower? Of having access to an infinite stream of long, short, amateur, or professionally produced content at all times if it only serves to leave a lot of us with shorter attention spans and a feeling that every piece of media is as interchangeable as the last, rarely getting invested in anything? What is the point of having everything you need when nothing feels truly productive? What is the point of building something yourself when, in a world as post-scarcity as the one in DIY, ordering it online would be more efficient and probably at a negligible cost compared to what it'd take to build by hand? Do It Yourself doesn't just portray high school girls doing it themselves, but also asks if there's a point in doing it yourself. Characters like Poonin and Jobco start off regarding the act of building something by hand as old fashioned, moldy, and largely pointless. It is an act that flies in the face of the efficiency and accessibility of their society. It just seems baffling to seemingly regress back into the olden days as a hobby. And yet the anime has a counter to this argument. Sure, it's inefficient, but is it really pointless? Characters in DIY are frequently depicted as being happier because of their hobby. It not only brings the characters together and gives them cause to socialize with each other, but there's also just a certain satisfaction to laying each wooden board yourself, slowly seeing a project come together, and, well, doing it yourself. Sure, the robots could probably build it faster, at a higher quality, and honestly better. 
but that doesn't mean we have to offload all our work to them. Doing it yourself doesn't need to fly in the face of efficiency. Can the two not coexist? Wouldn't offloading all the work to AI cause us to lose something fundamental about the human experience? In a world where you don't have to do anything, you ought to find meaning, struggle, and joy in what you don't have to do. Art, DIY, and myriad other things. We humans don't have to give them up once the robots can do it better. We can instead continue being productive in our pointless struggle to follow our dreams. It may not be productivity as our society currently understands it, but in a world where no action is necessary, we should chase the unnecessary that adds spice to life. I still personally position myself as being largely against AI art, but do-it-yourself definitely made me at least marginally less cynical about the whole thing. It's nice to see a more optimistic interpretation of the future in fiction for a change. I think do-it-yourself's message is incredibly relevant to today's technological landscape. It asks important questions and gives important answers, and unlike some shows, not naming names, I think its exploration of its theme was overall really well handled from start to finish. I'd even go so far as to say that do-it-yourself's theming is the best part about it, or at the very least, what I felt most enraptured by during the whole thing. And that's why I wanted to talk about it. To all the DIY fans out there watching right now, that's the end of the video! You can click off now. Go on, just watch another video or something. Maybe another positive DIY review? Come on, no one's stopping you. Are you gone yet? Alright. I kinda don't like this show. To be honest, I mainly made this video to talk about DIY's impeccable theming, but I feel like it'd be strange to talk solely positively about a show that I don't really like all that much. I thought I would like it judging from the first episode, and I was kinda having fun for a few episodes, but that quickly changed. My exact thoughts on this show have been hard to pin down. It's not a bad show per se, in fact, I could list off plenty of good things about it, but it just wasn't an enjoyable experience for me, and I've been going back and forth on whether I think it's the show's fault for not being written a certain way, or mine for somehow having faulty standards. Giving voice to these complicated feelings is no easy feat. But if I had to provide a thesis statement, I'd say that some of the show's characters are somewhat charming at times, and occasionally show flashes of depth, but that largely they are difficult to be truly invested in, and the show's insufferably bland character interactions sap away most of its moment-to-moment -moment entertainment value. But that's a pretty loaded statement, so let's decompress it a bit, starting with the dialogue. Consider the following in introspection in a similar vein as the first part of this video. But before we get to that, 0% of you are subscribed. Literally none of you. This channel has 0 subscribers. If you open my channel and see that I have even a single subscriber, that is because YouTube glitched out. You want to be my first subscriber. You want to be my first subscriber. You want to be my first subscriber. And if you choose not to subscribe, that's bad. Until you click subscribe, sleep with one eye open. Because this is a show about a bunch of high school girls working together, the character interactions tend to depict them being very harmonious with each other. There's little in the way of friction between them, and even when there is friction, it's either resolved immediately or is so minimal and calm that calling it friction feels outright misleading. The teamwork is always smooth and never depicts character quirks as being overly disruptive to the group's ability to function smoothly. Most of the interactions boil down to the characters working together on DIY and every so often showing off their surface level personality traits or quirks, as a way to spice up the conversation and bring some life to it. Punchlines are very simple and never bombastic. The show is rarely funny or tries all that hard to be funny in the same way something such as Nichijo or Love is War does. It's more so trying to give you a warm fuzzy feeling by watching these characters interact with each other in the way that they do. Conversations rarely go into a whole lot of depth about a topic that isn't DIY. The conversation at the beginning of episode 2 about what the characters would do if they didn't have to do anything is the exception to the rule by far. 
Mostly, it's characters working together on DIY, talking about DIY, and occasionally showcasing their incredibly simple character dynamics. Aside from my insertions of my personal opinion, I hope even DIY fans can agree that I accurately represented this show's average character interaction. Anyway, I think that blows. What is supposed to be the appeal of these conversations? I know what it is, and we'll get to that, but let's rule some stuff out first. It's not particularly funny, so it's not enjoyable on the level of comedy. I like very chaotic, spastic character interactions, and this doesn't have that. The conversations aren't about anything particularly interesting, unless you're a huge DIY nerd or want to get into it. I'm neither of those. And the character interactions, although occasionally sporting charming dialogue, are so simple and lacking in substance that without any of the prior appeals I listed, it's dull. So like, what is there to cling on to? What's the appeal here? I'm not saying it needs all of the things I listed here, I'm just saying that it needs something to latch myself onto. Maybe this would all be forgivable if the show managed to endear me to the characters and or add some legitimate depth to them. But while some of the characters have some depth, I largely felt nothing but apathy for this cast. Throughout the show, the metaphor that kept on appearing in my head was character card flashing. What I mean by this is that throughout the dialogue scenes, characters would generally be talking about DIY, and then occasionally say something indicative of their surface-level personality traits. Then, the show would just move on. It was like the show was having the characters flash an ID card signifying that they are indeed a distinct character, as if you'd forget without these small reminders. But is there really a significant difference between character card flashing and having a character? The more I thought about it, the more I realized I was just describing characterization in general. So why does said characterization ring so hollow in this show? Something I like in characterization is this idea of variance. It's something that a lot of my favorite characters have, and it's something I try to add to the characterization in my own stories the best I can. What I mean by this is that the characters won't just be depicted with one unwavering personality trait expressed in the same general way each time, but instead, the entire range of their personality will be covered. They have different dynamics with different people and behave entirely differently depending on the situation. To display all the various shades of the same person and turn it into something cohesive is to me the best thing to emphasize in character writing. It's like a gentle tap on the shoulder that you should continue watching, because maybe these characters you've grown to know will do something completely unexpected, and then you'll know them even better. It's not like DIY lacks this entirely. Putin and Jobco form a slightly different dynamic than what they have with the rest of the cast due to them living together, and Putin is a little more tsundere around Yua than anyone else, but it's minimal. The characters largely interact with everyone the same way, and furthermore, they tend to communicate their surface-level personality traits in a similar way each time. Their personalities are never portrayed in a way that's unexpected or overly unique, barring Yua, who we'll get to. Jobko's haughtiness is never more or less than her sounding superior and smug when she shouldn't be. Rei's seriousness is never more or less than her I dunno, being vaguely serious. Koki's cheerfulness is never more or less than… I think you get my point. I think I'd be able to buy into these characters' personalities more if the show found new and interesting ways of exploring them throughout the show. Have Jobko be an entirely different kind of smug depending on who she's talking to, or stop being smug entirely around one of the characters, or at least give her multiple different creative ways of being haughty so her personality doesn't feel so one note. But instead, her personality is conveyed through this incredibly narrow spectrum, and it gets repetitive. It's like flashing an ID card signifying her character. She acts smug for a line or two, and then the show moves on. It feels rather hollow. There may be some times when she acts different, the show is in fact competently written, but it's too rare an occurrence for my liking. It's not even like the characters lack depth outright. 
Using Pudin as an example again, she's a tsundere, except for the fact that she and Yua only kiss in my fanfiction. She is someone who has difficulty admitting her true feelings, and covers it up with put-on standoffishness. She also frequently finds herself blushing. That's all pretty typical, and not that interesting. But, she also strongly believes that once we create self-aware AI, humanity will be brought into a utopia where we don't have to work anymore. That's a legitimately interesting ideology. That's something Nisio Eason would write, and I love Nisio Eason. Furthermore, throughout the series, she has legitimate character development as she learns to more readily admit her true feelings. But not a whole lot of focus is placed on this character depth. We get the conversation in episode 2, and then we get some gradual development throughout the series, but it's mostly sandwiched in between, well, character card flashing. Putin just acting like a tsundere in very basic, uninteresting interesting ways. And mind you, Pudin is one of the better examples of characterization in this show. All this might not have been that big of a deal if the show had other appeals to its dialogue. Any of the appeals that I mentioned earlier would have done wonders in spicing things up in my book. I'm a simple man. If your character says or does fun things, I will like them. But it just doesn't. I'm consistently left wondering, what's the appeal of this show? Because unless I try my absolute damnedest to lower my standards for what I consider to be an interesting character, and suddenly find the most unfunny, basic jokes in existence side-splittingly hilarious, I just don't see it. Well, I do, but once again, we'll get to that. Even worse than that, though, is that some of the characters in this show feel outright generic. I feel dirty saying that about this show, especially considering how phenomenal its character designs are. But really take a step back and wonder, what separates Takumin from other characters in her trope? Why should I partake in this shy girl instead of all the other myriad shy girls? In my Tomozaki video, I talked about how the show immediately establishes Fumia with particularity, in order to show that he isn't a generic shy boy character and get you immediately interested in him. But Rei, Koki, and Takumin pretty much entirely lack particularity. The one exception to all this is Yua. Yua Serifu is the one character in this show I legitimately like. She's absurdly clumsy, knocking into things and injuring herself to the point where she has perfect daily attendance at the school nurse's office, and has become friends with her. She spaces out constantly, and has an active imagination. The viewer is often shown her wild imagination, which is always fun to see, and her dialogue is consistently entertaining. I will always remember the line, it'd be great if Steam was edible, because it's just so Yua. She manages to feel pretty distinct from other characters in her trope. Although she's as useless as Yui and as imaginative as Osaka, the fact that she's so clumsy so as to injure herself constantly, surprisingly bold in her own way, as well as many of her more charming lines of dialogue, give her a distinct texture from characters one may feel tempted to draw comparisons to. All in all, while not a great character, she's still a good one. And if I liked every character as much as Yua, well, this video would have ended a while ago. And the core reason for why I like Yua is because I think she's fun. Her dialogue is the most consistently funny and charming, and the scenes displaying her imagination fill me with whimsy. So I'm attached to her. See, I don't have that high of standards for characters. I'm not an asshole, mostly. I just need a character to say fun things and make me charmed by them. But none of the other characters in this show really do that for me, for all the reasons I've listed thus far. The show slowly regains some of its momentum as it goes along. I'd say the latter half of episode 9 is where the turning point begins, as Yua is made to confront the idea that she might not be all that valuable to the DIY team, before realizing that everyone else values her and enjoys her as a person. Then, the final few episodes depict the climax of the entire show, where the gang builds the treehouse they've been planning for so long, capped off with an ending so sentimental that if I actually cared about the characters, I probably would have cried. So, at least it ends on something akin to a high note. The show certainly has charm, the directing is legitimately great, the character animation expressive, and some of the dialogue and character ticks reveal legitimate effort put into making this show stand out. But it never truly escapes that rote feeling. 
If you really just want a well-directed and comfy show, and nothing I've said so far has dissuaded you, then sure, go ahead and watch it. But I wouldn't really recommend it to most people. There is an asterisk to all this, though. Like I said at the beginning of this section, I wonder if this might be more of a personal thing than an actual flaw with the show. Which sounds kinda contradictory to what I've been saying, but let me explain. I don't like Iyashike. Just as a genre, I'm not a huge fan of it. Granted, Iyashike is something of a vague descriptor. I've seen people call Barakamon an Iyashike, and uh... Um... What I really mean by Iyashike here is shows that hardcore Yuru Camp fans go crazy for. Ya slow loops and asteroid in loves, basically. I dislike Yuru Camp and other such shows for similar reasons to DIY. The closest I've ever gotten to truly liking an Iyashike is Nan Nan Biori, and even then, I dropped it halfway through season 2 because I felt like the show was overstaying its welcome. I've heard from other people that there's a distinct appeal to shows with slow pacing and incredibly naturalistic, albeit sparsely packed, dialogue, with simple characters who make equally simple, lifelike jokes to each other, where the punchlines aren't zany and out there but rather fluffy and decidedly not bombastic, often with a thematic emphasis on friendship and cooperation. There's a distinct appeal to shows meant to relax the mind in this particular way. I don't get that appeal. I mean, on a cognitive level, I understand why someone would find that relaxing, but on the level of watching these shows and trying to find fun in it, well, I just don't find it fun. I prefer more chaotic experiences, if my video on Urusei Yatsura wasn't evidence enough of that. Or if not chaotic, at least dialogue with more of an intellectual hook to it, or more bombastic and or witty jokes, or dialogue that feels more dynamic or unique. But DIY's interactions a lot of the time felt template and bare bones, and the characters were mostly uninteresting. I'll let you decide if the show's actually bad or if my standards are the true evil, but for now, I think it might be time to avoid any future Yuru Camp-esque shows I might be considering partaking in. Sorry if this video cucked you, DIY fans. I do mean what I said in the first section, but I'm just not a fan of this show. Don't click off yet, broskies. It's shilling time. Later this month, I should be discussing the first Zare Goto light novel, which I do enjoy, so be sure to stick around for that if you want to see more positive reviews. In the meantime, if you're molding over this video, you can check out my novel and trash it in the comments section. Or maybe even check out me and Neon Manta's podcast, where we discuss seasonals and occasionally make jokes that Twitter would hang us for. Be sure to like and subscribe and all that, maybe share it around? I'm a small channel, I heavily benefit from word of mouth spread. Thank you to Vlusky for reading over this script twice to check for errors, his channel will be linked below, and thanks again for watching, I'll see y'all next time.